It gives me great pleasure to welcome Val McDermott tonight. She's one of the most exciting writers currently writing in crime fiction. Uh, she's one of my personal favorites, which is always nice. Um, I can still remember the first book of hers that I read. It was Wire in the Blood, and I knew as soon as I read it that this was somebody I wanted to read every single book she'd ever written, and I have, including a terrific nonfiction book uh, uh, of, uh, about women detectives called A Suitable Job for a Woman, which is a really great book uh, uh, for those of you who are looking for something a little different. Now, uh, I counted up her books. She's written 30 books in the last 25 years. She's got three series plus standalones. But this was after two other careers, first as a playwright, then as a, a journalist, both of which for, for which she won awards and where she was highly successful. So we have all of that coming together in these wonderful novels, and now she's decided to take on another career. She's written a children's book called uh, My Granny is a Pirate, which is currently not available here, except we're going to tell you how you can get it from the uh, Val McDermott special gift shop, bookshop, that she knows all about. So if you're looking for a Christmas gift for the kiddos, now we know what. Now, all of this uh, in one woman with a wonderful Scots brogue, um, we want to welcome tonight Val McDermott. I'm going to take you with me everywhere I go so you can say <laughs> nice things about me. All true, all true. I never, I, I, I do not lie. Now, I'm trying to figure out what to do with this thing, so I'm just going to sit it here. And we're going to talk about the new book soon. But first, we're having a wonderful conversation in the back. You know, you have such a, you know, the, the term colorful life doesn't even begin to fill it out. Let's, d tell us how you got from uh, being the, uh, the, one of the youngest scholars ever to enter St. Hilda's Oxford. Yeah. Uh, to uh, the Toronto Public Library in one <laughs> paragraph. You just don't want to ask any questions, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, the story of how I got to Oxford in the first place is, is, is bizarre enough, because uh, I grew up in, in Fife on the east coast of Scotland uh, in a mining community. My parents were very much working class. My grandfathers were both miners. My dad worked in the shipyard. Um, and uh, people like us didn't do things like go to Oxford. But I had had my eyes opened by the public library uh, so I am one of these writers, thank you to public libraries, I'm one of those writers who wouldn't be a writer without the public library system. Uh, and my mum introduced me to libraries before I could even read, I mean before I could speak properly, I used to apparently say that I was going to the Labrador. Uh, and you know, some would say I've been going to the dogs ever since. But, um, I, I, I read, I devoured everything I could get my hands on in the library. And uh, because, of course, this was good Scottish Presbyterianism, you, you could take four books out at once, but two of them had to be non fiction. <laughs> you know, heaven forfend, you should have unmitigated pleasure. <laughs> but among the many books that I read was a series of school stories um, by a woman called Eleanor M. Brent Dyer, who wrote books called The Shally School Books, which some of you may have heard of. And. Um, one of the many things I learned from the Shelley School books, aside from learning that writing was a job that you got paid money for, and therefore I was perfectly suited for it because I could tell lies. <laughs> um, but one of the things I discovered from, from this, this series of books was that there were only three institutions of higher education. One was the Sorbonne in Paris, and I knew I couldn't go there because my French wasn't good enough. One was Oxford University, and the other was the Kensington School of Needlework. <laughs> So it was really a no-brainer that I would try to get into Oxford, um, and, and luckily um, they, had, uh, they had a fondness for, for um, ballsy kids with brass necks, so when they said to me, you know, you're very young, um, you know, how would you feel if we offered you a place for next year? And I just looked at them and said, well, I'd go someplace else, I'm not wasting a year. <laughs> And I look back at it now and I blush with shame, really, because I was, I was so gallant, it's a great gallus, that's a great Scottish word, um, I was so co overconfident, I suppose, um, that I, I, I got into Oxford against every, every available odds. And I left Oxford convinced that I was going to be 
a great writer. What did you study at art? I read English because I didn't, I didn't really know enough to, to study anything else. I mean, I didn't know there was anything else available, really. <laughs> you know, my, my life is a series of <laughs> judgment, decisions made based on almost no information. <laughs> Reading English at Oxford was one of them. Um, and I, I mean, it's like going into journalism thinking it's something to do with writing. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, how, uh, you know, you, you, were writing, you were writing plays when you were in your 20s. Yeah. And then you went. By in, accident. And, and, <laughs> by accident. Apparently by accident. <laughs> and I, then, I, what I thought was, I thought I was writing the great English novel. Because you know, you know how it is at 20 when you know the secrets of the universe? You know everything when you're 20, don't you? And, and so I was writing this great English novel and it, had, it, was, it was full of all the big emotions, you know, love and hate and grief and jealousy and betrayal. Um, and probably the one thing you could actually say for this is that I finished it. <laughs> uh, and I started sending it off to publishers. And you know, people sometimes tell you, you know, when they finish a book and they send it off to publishers and, and months go by and then finally it comes back and the publisher says, I'm sorry, this doesn't suit our list. I didn't have that experience. I was sending my book off and getting it back by return of post. <laughs> um, I think by the end I was actually getting letters from people I hadn't sent it to. <laughs> Please, we've heard about this book, don't send it. <laughs> but I, did, I, I, I showed it to a friend who was an actor and she read it and she said, well, I don't know much about novels, but I think this would make quite a good play. And so I thought, well, that's easy. You just cross out all the descriptions, leave in the dialogue. It's a play. <laughs> so I did that. And you know, I wrote a few extra scenes to cover the bits I'd crossed out. And I trotted off to the local theatre and, and handed this over to the, the director. Um, and he said, this is marvellous because I want to do a, a season of new plays in the studio theatre and I'd love to do this. So at the age of 20-something, 20 23, I think, I was a, a professionally performed playwright, entirely by accident. <laughs> But I was convinced, you know, that, that any minute now Hollywood would be knocking at the door that I would be the next Harold Pinter or Tom Stoppard. <laughs> but of course it didn't quite work out like that. I adapted the play for, for BBC Radio, um, but the difficulty I had with, with writing more plays was that I didn't know what I'd done right. <laughs> and so I couldn't replicate it. Again, you know, decision based on not enough information here. Um, but I kept trying to write plays and failing. And eventually, my agent fired me. <laughs> Which, you know, is pretty much the low point of your career. If the person who stands to make some money off of anything you successfully do gets rid of you, it's not a good omen, you know? Um, so that was really probably the low point. I was a journalist by that stage, um, but journalism had always been the only thing I could do while I waited to become a proper writer. Um, you know, I've never been very good with authority. <laughs> And journalism is famously non-hierarchical. And as also, I've got a very low boredom threshold, so the thing about journalism is it's different things every day. Yeah. So I thought I could manage being a journalist, you know. It wouldn't drive me completely mad, and I was possibly employable as a journalist. Um, so while I was doing that, uh, I decided, I'd realised by then that the problem with writing plays was that I didn't know what I was doing. And maybe I should think about writing something, but I did have some vague notion of what I should be doing. And I'd always read crime fiction from the earliest age, and so I thought, well, I know how a crime novel works. You know, you've got to have a dead body. You've got to have a detective. You've got to have either lots of suspects or no suspects at all, and at the end, you've got to find out who did it. So that, that seemed to me to be a basic template, you know, that I could maybe work with. And if I made my detective a journalist, then, because I was a journalist, I knew what journalists did, it would be really easy, you know. Um, uh, but then the problem I had, I suppose, was, was what kind of crime novel? Because in the UK, I mean, I don't have to tell you, in the UK in the, in, in, in the early 80s, there really was, there was only police procedurals and village mysteries, yeah. neither of which fell into my span of knowledge. You know, I mean, I discovered when I moved to England that the world was not like St Mary Mead, that Agatha Christie was essentially writing science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Places did not exist. Um, and so, I mean, I, it was some years later that Colin Dexter told me that you didn't have to know anything about the police to write police procedurals, you just made it up. But I didn't know that at the time. This is, this is for those of you who, who are not sure, this is Inspector Morse, all made up, yeah, wonderful. All made up, yeah. <laughs> um, so, th but the thing that really kick-started me was, uh, was a friend sending me a copy of Sarah Paretsky's first book when it came out in, in America, Indemnity Only. Um, she sent me this, this book with a note saying, I think you'll like this. 
Um, and it was one of those, you know, light bulb goes on in head moments. It's, it's incredible to think about it, but it's been 30 years since that book came yeah. out. And I reviewed it, and I remember very distinctly reading the first eight pages and realizing that it was a woman writing it. She was the first. And it was such a shock. Mm. And it was so good. I mean, everybody kept saying, oh, it's Sam Spade in skirts. It wasn't Sam Spade in skirts no, at all. It was quite different. Was quite different. And I loved, I loved the urban setting. It got completely away from St Mary Mead. Yeah. Um, I loved that it had a female protagonist who wasn't wearing a pink fluffy bed jacket. But who and, liked shoes. Yeah, liked right. shoes. Good and, shoes. And who had a brain and a sense of humour. Oh. And didn't have to get one of the guys to help her every time she did some detecting doing. Yeah. Um, and, and, but I also loved the fact that it had politics had personal politics and a wider sense of social politics and it seemed to me that this was the kind of book I wanted to aspire to write and so with that in front of me as an inspiration I buckled down to write my first crime novel. Well, that's, it, Sorry it, that was a bit of a long story. No, for no, the she, opened, she opened a lot of doors for a lot of people that was she was she was that's that's a very exciting kind of you know it's good to remember that you know 30 years ago you know, all you got were guys and guys and more guys. Or occasionally you had Nero Wolf referring to women detectives, of which there were one as she dicks. Yes. I've not recovered from that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and Sarah has, was, was you know, unfailingly generous and supportive to all of us who came up in her wake. You know, she, she, no one should ever forget the debt we all owe to Sarah Paretsky. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. For the, well, you know, once you get, you've told us about why mysteries. Now, this is another question I know everybody wants to know. You, they want to know where your characters come from, but I want you to tell them about how you whip them into shape. <laughs> Those of you who remember, we've had people who say, oh, the characters take over and tell the story on their own. Well, Ms. McDermott's characters obey. <laughs> well, it's a nonsense, really, isn't it, to say your characters take on a life of their own. Really, if, if my characters had any agency, they'd be doing my shopping for me. <laughs> doing my ironing, cleaning my house, you know, doing something useful. Um, but the bottom line is your characters do what they do because it comes from inside you. There may be points along the way where you suddenly almost, you, you make a sudden realisation of what a character's capable of. But ultimately they come from inside your head and from your experience of the world. You cannot... You cannot ultimately create anything that's outside your understanding and experience. Everything in those books ultimately comes from inside me. Um, I'm sorry about that. For those of you who are, those of you who are maybe thinking I was quite a nice person, I'm sorry about that. You know, but f for me, um, the motive spring of of the best crime fiction is always character. Suspense comes from character. Story comes from character. Everything comes from those creations inside my head. The suspense comes from character because the readers are passionate about those characters. They love them or they hate them, but they have to know what happens to them. And that's why you, you, you want to read the next chapter, because you're desperate to find out what happens to these people. What's the next stage? What's the next step on the journey? Are they going to make the next step on the journey? And so when I'm starting off with a book, I start in a slightly different place depending if it's series or if it's standalone. If it's series, you've, you've already got your characters in place, you've got that nexus of central characters and they do the things they do because they are the people they are. And with the best will in the world, Tony Hill isn't suddenly going to turn into an action hero. You know, <laughs> he's not going to be abseiling down a tall building, you know, or karate kicking his way to freedom. <laughs> it's not what he is, it's not what he does. Um, so when I'm starting with a Tony Hill novel, I know, I know who I'm dealing with, so the story has to work within the confines of those characters. But when I'm working on a standalone, I can be led initially by story, I can make the story work in its own terms and then I have to find out whose story it is. Who are these people? Why are they in my living room? What are they doing here? Where did they come from? What has turned them into the people who behave in this particular way? So it all becomes a to and fro process, you know, here's what I need them to do in this novel. Why would you do those things? What has made you the person you are? So I'm constantly raking through my own experience of the world. I'm raking through the lives of my friends, my family. Nobody's sacred. Sorry, we're vampires. We eat our own lives and then we just suck the blood out of everybody else's. It's not a nice thing. But, you know, if you know a writer, if, you, if your best friend is a writer, you just watch their eyes the next time you're telling them something terrible about your life. <laughs>
is that the human being in them is totally sympathetic and supportive and they mean it when they say, I'll be here for you. But the writer in them is going, could you just say that again? I didn't quite catch it. <laughs> um, so that's what we do. And those, those, those characters end up, you know, they're constructed from that data bank of, of human behavior that I've observed, that I've seen. Well, this takes us to your new book, The Vanishing Point. This is a standalone. Um, and I don't want to give anything away about this book, folks. I mean, those of you who, who, who read my know that I'm, I, I, I'm rabid about not giving away anything. And this one is sufficiently complex that I can give you very little. But uh, the, t the, the, the... It's got a beginning, a middle, and an it's end. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. But not well, necessarily in that order. Fairly in that order. And not necessarily so you'll recognize them either. Uh, but the most important thing is we have two women here who strike up a very unlikely and odd friendship. And so the spine of the book is really this strange friendship. And maybe you'd say a little word about that because they're very strange. You know, one woman is a sophisticated intellectual writer and the other is the star of a reality TV show. Yeah, I, I think um, my life in many ways has been full of confounded expectations. Um, and so when I'm writing, I, I don't like to take the easy answers. I like to, to poke about a bit and see what, uh, what, what the other possibilities might be. Um, I'm much more careful about my characters' lives than I am about my own. <laughs> um, and this, this um, when I was a journalist, I, I sometimes covered showbiz stories, and sometimes that would mean doing what we called a buy-up where you'd have maybe a Coronation Street star or something who wanted to sell their story, some story, maybe their marriage had broken up or something. Uh, so we would whisk them away from the opposition and you know, I'd spend maybe two weeks, practically 24 seven with, with one of these Coronation Street stars, eliciting their story from them and keeping the, uh, keeping the opposition away from them. Uh, and it was very clear that, that what I was writing was not a ghost written event, a version of their life, it was, it was all done as an interview. But what struck me as being very interesting were the contrasts between the public images that these people presented and the person that you got to know behind the mask. And I did explore this a bit in a novel called Starstruck earlier, a Kate Brannigan novel. But that was in terms of, of people who, if you like, actually do something to earn their fame. But it didn't deal with the, the phenomenon, the recent phenomenon of, of famous for being famous. Um, where you have these reality TV show characters who in a way are thrown in at the deep end because they don't have the time to construct their public image. You know, politicians and sports stars and actors, they all come up, they earn their stripes and in the process they evolve a kind of public image that we all consume as, as the real story. But for a lot of these reality TV shows, it's very raw. It's not, it's not something they entirely, they've not been working all their lives for this. And for a lot of people uh, who get onto these shows, it's quite often what they see as a way out of, of a life without possibilities. You know, it used to be um, that, that you know, like young men got out of their, their, their lives of poverty and, and hopelessness by sp via sport, um, and, and women would perhaps get it by singing, perhaps music, sport, the traditional ways out. Now a lot of it is reality TV, and I thought it would be interesting to to set up a situation where you have a, a ghostwriter, Stephanie, um, who is, takes on the commission to write the biography of this, this apparently, frankly, scummy personality who's come Harlot. from very crappy, Scarlet poor Harlot. background. Is scummy. Scarlet Harlot? That's Scarlet the Harlot. Scarlet yeah. the Harlot. Yeah. Sorry, the Scarlet Harlot, she's known. Um, and um, she's, she's, she's a bit of a slapper. She's a bigot. She's apparently on the face of it stupid, um, and, but she has the capacity to, to intrigue the public, to entertain the public, and in spite of everything, she has some kind of charisma that people like. So Stephanie takes on the job of writing her autobiography, fully expecting not to like her and, and even to despise her. And as she gets to know the person behind the mask, she discovers there's a bit more to Scarlet than meets the eye. And the book, the centre of the book, is um, really the exploration of that history. And, and we see Stephanie discovering Scarlet. Uh, and, and the book opens with uh, the airport abduction of Scarlet's son, who Stephanie is looking after in Chicago airport.